students so today lecture we will study about biological treatment of drinking water which is basically an addition to the conventional drinking water uh, treatment so that even the trace nutrients and even the trace contaminants are removed now biological treatment of drinking water is tricky because as the name suggests we require microbes to eat the contaminants but remember microbes don't like to grow in environment where there is not sufficient nutrient for them and in drinking water we cannot provide microbes the electron donors and the electron acceptors at a very high concentration which actually makes biological treatment of drinking water little tricky but there are ways around it which we have used and we will see in the lecture today how we can biologically treat drinking water despite the limitation of its oligotrophic environment so let's start so dear students as we talked about last time and we when we i introduced to you the considerations for biological drinking water treatment there are many advantages with biological drinking water treatment first is that we get rid of natural organic matter and thus we have nothing in our water that will produce disinfection by products and i must mention that dpps or disinfection by products are neither good for environment nor good for public health so we definitely don't want them in our drinking water and how are they formed when the disinfectant the residual disinfectant interacts with the natural organic matter it reacts and it forms dpps we also get rid of color perchlorate chloroform other algal toxins which are uh, usually have pretty good amount of toxicity and iron manganese nitrate and chromate so let's look at why drinking water has a scope for biological treatment it is because drinking water has biological instability which implies there are things in drinking water that upon interaction with microbes or biological activities will decay so that is the instability part in biological instability so what are these it has bio biodegradable organic matter so it has things in it that can be eaten by microbes and thus will change the chemistry of drinking water it has ammonia nitrate ferrous manganese sulfide now among these some of them are electron donors some of them are electron acceptors and i want you to pause this video here take a moment and try to identify which of these here ammonia nitrate uh, nitrite iron manganese and sulfide will be electron donors and which will be electron acceptors briefly i can tell you so i hope you have figured out which of these are electron donors which of these are electron acceptors it's pretty easy if something is highly reduced like ammonia then it will be electron donor and sulfide but if something is highly oxidized then it will be electron acceptor now we also get many metals upon corrosion so once water has reached the drinking water distribution system then corrosion gives metals in oxidized state to drinking water where the reduction can happen now all of these contribute to microbial growth they can be either used as electron acceptor or electron donor and thus we have uh, we will have biological activity in drinking water system so what is the problem with this biological instability well we should understand this that um, drinking water is an oligotrophic environment which means that there are not enough nutrients oligos means less so food is less everything is less so even if we give little bit amount of food little bit amount of electron acceptor and donor the microbes will grow as fast as they can because it's almost a do or die situation for them you get food you use it and the other thing is when this happens when microbes consume whatever is available to them we have an increase in heterotrophic plate count which is microbes that can consume different kinds of organic matter they increase in drinking water and this also overall this um, biological and chemical activity will result into taste and odor issue so the taste will get spoiled the it the water might start smelling and then we might also have production of nitrite which is very bad because it might cause blue baby syndrome and because heterotrophic plate count is increasing which is another way of saying the heterotrophic bacteria are increasing what will they do when they eat food they will consume oxygen in the drinking water thus the do of the water reduces and this is very beautiful and important that the microbial activity actually induces encourages corrosion so notice here the corrosion on corrosion the pipes will give microbes some metals that they can use metabolize and get energy from and on the other hand 
The corrosion also gives microbes attachment surface for them to stick to. Then microbes they actually uh, via galvanic corrosion drought they corrode the pipe material thus they feed each other both the microbial growth in drinking water distribution system and corrosion thus it is really important to get rid of biological instability so we cannot have the rampant growth in distribution system in the first place before we have extensive damage in our pipes. So let us look at biodegradable organic matter where does it come from? It is largely derived from natural organic matter and these are the ones that do not are not removed during conventional drinking water treatment processes and they can range anywhere from certain microgram per liter to milligram per liter as carbon. So very trace amount or they can have substantial amount. So this is one of the picture of humic acid. Now remember this is humic acid is only one of the natural organic matter. Natural organic matter is basically organic matter in nature that we are not able to characterize because their, uh, their, their chemistry, their structure is very complex. So it is really hard to measure them. So we have a shortcut, we convert everything into how much carbon is present and that is how we measure them. Um, now biodegradation of biodegradable organic matter, because this is the organic matter that, is, that has really complex structure like this, usually aromatic. and whatever could degrade easily has already degraded, we are left with very slow degrading bomb, biodegradable organic matter. Thus the kinetics of degradation is very slow. But there is still a certain fraction that will be degraded very fast and here is a list of what will be degraded really fast. So how can we enhance the speed of very slowly degrading biodegradable organic matter? So coming back to this picture, look here. It is there are so many uh, aromatic rings in it and most of them are benzene like rings or naphthalene like rings and they, they are very stable and very resistant to degradation by microbes. So what we do is we find a way to break the structure apart into simpler compounds that are faster to degrade. So what one of the most successful techniques for this is ozonation. So we ozonate the water and the norm natural organic matter degrades into simpler compounds that microbes can degrade fast. Usually it encourages formation of aldehydes and other organic compounds. But here is the problem, natural organic matter is very difficult to quantify. So we do not know how much ozonation we should do and remember ozonation is pretty expensive a process. So how can we measure natural organic matter? There are two basic ways that we are currently using. Well there are others for example in my lab we use UV based spectrophotometry to see um, the to see how much it is present and to get an idea of what kind of natural organic matter is present, but it has lot of limitations. The other is we calculate <coughs> amount of assimilable organic carbon. Assimilable as the name suggests is the amount of organic carbon that microbes can assimilate which is basically saying they can use it as a carbon source to make their structure, to make their body. So whatever they can utilize and make part of the cell is assimilable organic carbon and there is a standardized uh, way of doing it. We have certain strains that we have identified, they are put into the water and we measure um, how much of assimilable organic carbon is present. Here is a limitation, it probably only measures the AOC or assimilable organic carbon that is easy to degrade. So if you remember here there are certain parts of bi biodegradable organic matter in drinking water which are easy to degrade. Most likely these um, microbes only degrade and consume these easy to degrade uh, parts of water and that is how they increase their biomass. And if we notice that AOC is less than 10 microgram carbon per liter of carbon per liter then we say the water is biologically stable which means we should not expect rampant microbial growth in drinking water. The other is biodegradable dissolved organic carbon. So what we do here is we have a mixed bacterial culture and we inoculate the drinking water with that culture and we measure how DOC changes or dissolved organic carbon changes. It is not very sensitive minimum detection is 100 microgram carbon per liter and notice here we cannot tell if it is stable we can only tell how unstable it is and this is very beautiful and helpful compared to AOC because it tells us about a wider range of biodegradable organic material and not just the easily degradable portion. So let us look at biological treatment now. So the, the 
point of biological treatment is that within drinking water treatment plant itself, we want to get rid of all biological instability. So, by the time the water reaches the water distribution system, there is no scope for corrosion, there is no scope for by, uh, growth of heterotrophic plate count or heterotrophic bacteria and that they, thereby there is no scope for having pathogens in our drinking water or having our pipes corroded and destroyed. And what is the alternative to this? If we do not do biological treatment of drinking water, the alternative is chlorination, heavily chlor chlorinating the water. Now, uh, in one of the previous lectures, I have mentioned how in December 2015, January 2016, there was a major outbreak of jaundice in Shimla and thousands of people fell sick. I mean, officially some two to three, nearly 3000 people were hospitalized and data is not present for other people. So, we suspect a lot more than 3000 people were sick, but we do not know. Uh, so, in Shimla, you know, the, the jaundice was found out that it is hepatitis E virus, which is waterborne pathogen, as you remember from your previous lecture. In order to safeguard the public health, the amount of chlorine in the drinking water treatment plant, in water storage tanks, and even in the effluent of STP, sewage treatment plant, was upped. So, they took the heavy chlorination um, approach to removing biological instability. There are severe disadvantages with heavy chlorination. First of all, remember that if you are not removing the biological instability, you still have lot of natural organic matter in your water and now you are adding chlorine to it in a very good dose. So, this chlorine or and the residual disinfectant of chlorine will react with the natural organic matter and form disinfection byproducts, which is very, very bad for environment and also not very good for public health. The other thing is the chlorine itself is not good for public health. In over the or in long run, it can cause cancer and many other ailments. So thus, uh, we really don't want um, to switch to the over chlorination approach, and we want to look at biological removal approach instead. And in this slide, I have the phrase called chemical warfare: kill everybody, and have so much disinfectant that um, there is no scope for pathogens to grow in drinking water system. Now, note here that when we are over chlorinating, we are not only killing the microbes or chemical warfare against microbes that we know are present in the water at the time of chlorination, but we have lot of chlorine residual disinfectant left with when it when the water goes to water distribution network. And so, if there is any pathogen that ingresses or intrudes the water distribution network through a port then that should also come in when it when it comes in contact with the residual disinfectant it should die. However, there are other beautiful things happening that we will talk in one of our later uh, lectures when we talk about biofilms. So, there are these protective niches in micro environments and even big environments at times within water distribution network where microbes can be protected from access to chlorine and other disinfectants. So, no matter how much we up the level of our dis disinfectant, microbes can always find a safe space in water distribution network. So, we are very clever and we launch a chemical warfare against microbes, they are cleverer and they find safe places to hide until they are in good population and the disinfectant level is just enough for them to go out and infect public. So, that is why let us consider the approach of biological treatment of drinking water where we can eliminate the electron donors. And some of the common features are biofilms, we can use biofilms in a drinking water treatment which can capture the electron donors from uh, the water and utilize them. The other is aerobic processes, um, but there is a problem with aerobic processes. The aerobic process works in similar fashion as activated sludge process in base water treatment plant where we aerate the water. So, we are encouraging aerobic microbes to grow and if you remember aerobic microbes grow fastest because they use oxygen as electron acceptor and that is the best electron acceptor we have on earth for life. So, we increase the amount of aerobic microbes and we hope that they will consume all the biodegradable organic material. However, in extreme cases, you know when we do not have enough oxygen and remember aeration is a very expensive step, we might lead into septic conditions. So, your water will stink, foul, horrible. The other thing is um, 
we must be able to drive the efferent concentration of donors below S min. So, S is substrate, min is minimum, the minimum amount of substrate required for microbes to grow in water distribution network. So, this has to be really rigorous. And the other thing is we want to avoid excessive chlorination for the reasons I mentioned earlier to in this lecture. And look, there is a country that has almost done it. Netherlands has almost eliminated chlorination completely. And um, it so happens in India, chlorination is rampant. Every drinking water treatment plant, every wastewater treatment plant, chlorinate, chlorinate, chlorinate. And if there is an outbreak, overchlorinate, overchlorinate, overchlorinate. In fact, even if there is no outbreak from a precautionary measure, if it is rainy season, we will overchlorinate the water. So, there is a lot of scope of improvement in India and under Indian circumstances. But at the same time, because microbes can be so site specific and so distinct, and the conditions in India and the way we operate our water distribution network is so different, it is very important to first do indigenous research and find out how are microbes growing, how are they persisting in resisting disinfection and then decide what is the good approach for India. Well, that is the work I am doing by the way. All right, you know, let us look at biofilm pretreatment. So, this is uh, um, a member of uh, biofilm and this is a typical biofilm um, setup. And it works really well when you have quite good amount of uh, biodegradable organic matter. So, way, so biofilm treatment basically you have a biofilm and you pass your water through it and when the water passes through it biofilm will capture all the nutrients and degrade it. It is really nice because in our conventional drinking water system if we have you know we have two kind of sand filters rapid and slow. So, it will avoid clogging of the rapid sand filter because it has already eaten up all the organics and there is no scope for microbes to grow. We usually use large pore media, it can be fixed bed and fluidized bed, here we have fluidized sand by the way, fluidized bed and both approaches have, they have a similar principle that is high surface area for microbes to attach and grow and to come in contact with water. So, look here, the cylinder here is really uh, thin in its diameter. So, cross sectional area is not very large, but now we have fluidized sand. So, when the water is sent, it floats up and every sand particle lends its surface area for biofilms to grow and for to come in contact with water and degrade the surface area is very, very high, very high compared to cross sectional uh, area. And the hydraulic and it is really quick process because of the immense high surface area. So, hydraulic retention time is just minutes, really quick process. Now, let us look at hybrid biofiltration. This is where when we have dual media rapid sand filter, we can use two media sand, anthracite or GAC, activated charcoal and often ozone is used as a pretreatment. So, we use ozone to degrade the NOM, natural organic matter and enhance the biodegradability or the ease with which microbes can consume the organics and then we pass them through dual media rapid sand filter and this is applicable when bio biodegradable organic matter is low less than 1 milligram BODL per liter ok and but here is the problem if it is high and we are still using it let us say there is a rainy season and now we have lot of um, natural organic matter in our water then it will clog your it, it will um, cause lot of head loss in rapid sand filter and thus it would be better in that case to go for bio biofilm pretreatment. Now, let us look at slow sand filtration. In this case, we of course, as the name suggests, the filtration process is slower. So, infiltration rate is lower than that of rapid sand filter. Head loss is not a big concern, yeah. And the hydraulic loading is uh, less than rapid sand filter because it, the input infiltration rate is slow. It, but the advantage is that it does not require a lot of land area. And um, the biological activity is concentrated to a small region. It has a fancy word. Schmutzdecke. So, you remember the spelling, it will come in your test. Um, and when we notice that this biological mat, microbial mat of Schmutzdecke has grown enough, we can scrape it off. So, we know it has grown enough and our head loss increases beyond uh, what we want it to be, then we can scrape it off and allow the microbes to regrow. So, how it works is this we have indent, and here we have our Schmutzdecke where microbes are growing and this is a biofilm by the way, so this is biomass and this bio, this mess of biomass consumes the nutrients and then you have, you go through your rapid sound filter and you have outlet here. So, this removes all the natural organic matter, passes through the sand, 
so it's sand microbes will get stuck so there's no scope that you'll have microbes here and then you go ahead and do whatever you need to do and when this ha becomes too thick the schmutz decay layer then you can scrape it off and allow microbes to regenerate so this is really really helpful conventional slow sand filter the other is river bank filtration and I must say at the very onset that I'm very fortunate that I work in an institute where we have two stalwarts who have worked a lot on river bank filtration in India. In fact, for those of you who are familiar with North India and uh, well, I am more familiar with North India and I know that there are plenty of river bank filtration setups across Himalayas, lower Himalayas and in Uttarakhand. So Dr. Pradeep and Dr. Indu Mehrotra from IIT have worked immensely on this. The process of river bank filtration works this way that if you are taking water from a river then instead of directly taking it from the river pull it from the river bank. So we make a well in the river bank. So this is the river by the way this is the river already and here we draw a deep well and we allow the water to flow in through the soil. So the soil is doing the process of slow sand filtration okay and in the soil we have a lot of microbes that grow and filter and clean the water. So by the time the water reaches the well, the quality of water is really good. <coughs> and we have some groundwater here also by the way, which will dilute further. So this quality improves better because groundwater is typically pretty clean. And but it can have other limitations. And then we draw the water from the well as our raw uh, drinking water source. Okay. Now let's come to the next challenge that we have. So we have done rapid filtration. Now we have a big challenge uh, in our country and elsewhere too of denitrifying drinking water. And if we do not denitrify or we come incompletely denitrify, then we have health problems. And uh, particularly India is one of the regions where we have big issue because uh, we have lot of nitrogen in our water, lot of nitrogen in our soil and definitely it has increased after the green revolutions when we increased the utilization of, pesticides, uh, of fertilizers. The standard is that um, 10 milligram of nitrate as nitrogen per liter and we don't in India it's a major pollutant we are still working on how to denitrify in drinking water. Now uh, we are trying to remove an electron acceptor you are denitrifying yeah so you are trying to remove nitrate so you need to have electron donor to remove electron acceptor we need electron donor which can do the redox chemistry and get away. On other hand, if you want to remove electron donor like petroleum, then you need to add electron acceptor like oxygen, sulfate or nitrate and so that they can degrade and go away. So we need to add electron acceptor. Now what are the options that we have for electron acceptor? One of the options that we have is methanol, but there is an issue with methanol. It is only safe at lower concentration um, and I must say that methanol has been used successfully across the globe. So it is not non-doable, but uh, you have to be really... Uh, sure that the methanol we are adding is being used up for denitrification and hardly any methanol is left in the drinking water. The other is ethanol, acetate, we can add sulfur, we can add hydrogen gas and all of these can act as electron donors and denitrify. But here is an issue, be very careful, do not add too much. What will happen if you add too much? So pause the video and think about it, what will happen if you add too much? Okay, I, I hope that uh, you took your few, few minutes to figure out what happens when we add too much of electron donor in water. Let us say we added twice the amount that was required to denitrify. So we still have half of the electron donors left. Now these electron donors will go to our waste water distribution system and there microbes will find food. So if there is any microbe lingering in the water distribution system at the moment they come in touch with the food whether it is ethanol, methanol, acetate, sulfur, hydrogen, whatever, they will grow and then we will have an increase in heterotrophic plate count. And the way it works is that let us say I added sulfur as electron donor. So a microbe that can use sulfur as electron donor, then what will happen? It will grow and when that microbe dies, its cell debris can be food source for other heterotrophic bacteria. So it is not just microbes that can use sulfur, elemental sulfur as electron donor that will grow, but we will have quite diverse microbial communities within the drinking water distribution system. So we cannot use too much, we cannot use too little, it has to be just the right amount. So denitrification is challenging. Um, 
and the other thing is that we should minimize contact with atmosphere when we are denitrifying. Why do we want that? Why do we want to minimize uh, contact with air? Because air has oxygen and we are trying to convert nitrite into nitrogen gas so that it can go away. We are trying to do denitrification. If you bring in oxygen into the picture, microbes will prefer to use oxygen as electron acceptor and not nitrate. Remember aerobic organism, aerobic activity more uh, energetically advantageous for microbes. And this week you will have a homework on uh, denitrification where well one of the part of your homework in this week would be reading this review article wonderfully written in 2013 so it has been quite some time but they do a very good job in explaining what denitrification is what are the different electron donors electron acceptors that you can use so um, this will be one of the reading assignment for you but just letting you know you have something coming up this week now let's look at some challenges that we have with um, drinking water um, ensuring the quality of drinking water first is release of microbes so let's say I have biological treatment that I'm doing for my removing the biological instability, whether it is denitrifying or whether it is removing the natural organic matter or biodegradable organic matter. I'm increasing the population of microbes because the way it works is micro I increase the microbes and microbes feed on these electron donors, electron acceptors, and then they grow further and lo and behold, my water is clean. But there's a possibility that the microbes might escape into drinking water distribution system and thus might add to the number of bacteria in the uh, water and usually it happens in slow sand filtration so remember in slow sand filtration we have slow sand filter then we had our microbial layer so this mat sometimes can allow microbes to escape through uh, slow sand filter and go into water the other thing is sometimes um, within drinking water distribution system uh, there are some uh, some donors that are produced, some metabolites that can be utilized by microbes in the distribution system. For example, so this happens during distribution, not during treatment. So let's say during my drinking water treatment, I got rid of natural organic matter, I got rid of uh, nitrate, and I got rid of other biological instability, and I'm like, yo, I did it, I cleaned the water. But now I put my water into um, drinking water distribution system and there is there are things there the metabolites there that microbes can use to grow so in a way we notice that we do need to treat water to utmost standards in drinking water treatment plant but that will not ensure that the water is still clean when it moves through the uh, drinking water distribution network for example let's say i have residual disinfectant in form of chloramine now the chloramine might decay and it will give away NH3 and uh, sorry ammonium ion and that ammonium ion will be electron donor for microbes. Yeah, so microbes can be there who will consume the ammonium and then they will grow. So even if there were hardly any microbes in the drinking water when it was released from the plant in WDS water distribution system, we can have microbial growth. The other thing is corrosion. So there's corrosion happening, the metals are leaching, they are either in oxidized state or in reduced state. And in either way, there are microbes who can utilize them. We have iron reducing bacteria, we have iron oxidizing bacteria, all of them can grow in drinking water system. The other thing is once there are other microbes that use carbon dioxide, so they are autotrophs, they do not even need an organic source of carbon. So these autotrophs, if they couple up with other electron donors and chemical electron donors and uh, electron acceptors, when they grow, they create biomass and this biomass when they die can this cell debris can be used by heterotrophs to increase microbial population. So I have here growth of autotrophs leads to soluble microbial product, SMP formation and supports heterotrophic growth. So dear students, what are the solutions for these challenges? As of now, I would like to tell you that the scientists are still working. The engineers are still trying to figure out how can we stop microbial growth in water distribution network. In India, unfortunately, there is not a lot, lot, lot of research that is happening, but internationally, there are many global leaders who are working on it. Some of them that I can name right away are Dr. Mark Edwards, Dr. Amy Pruden in US, Dr. Amit Pinto, and they are working day and night to ensure that we can, that we have some insight into how we can keep our water clean within water distribution network. So I think uh, we. 
I think we finish our presentation today here and in the uh, next lecture and I think this is the end of all water treatment that we have. In the next lectures we will dig into ecosystems. How do microbes grow and um, utilize other ecosystems that are relevant and important. So um, that's all for today. Thank you.